Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the editor-in-chief of the New Books Network, and today I'm very pleased to say we have Benjamin Nathans on the show. I know him as Ben because I've known him for 30 years. Unbelievable, Ben. And we'll be talking about his new book, To the Success of Our Helpless Cause, The Many Lives of the Soviet Dissident Movement. It comes out in August from our friends at Princeton University Press. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you, Marshall. Really great to be with you. Absolutely. I, I, I'm I always glad to talk to you. As we were discussing in the pre-interview, we did an episode on uh, Memorial, and we'll touch on that. Memorial is an important organization in, in Russia, and as I say, we'll come back to that. But I always begin my interviews with the same question, and uh, that is, why did you write this book? And just as a preface to that question, one of the reasons I ask this question is because these books take forever to write. I don't think people realize this. I I I finished one recently. It took me ten years. This one's decades in the making. Yes. Why would anybody do that? <laughs> it is an exercise in what I would call extreme delayed gratification. <laughs> and I I came to the topic uh, kind of on two different levels. the The immediate pragmatic level was I found myself in an academic position where. I had to teach Soviet history for the first time. I had previously worked mostly on the imperial era. I was a bit put off by the sort of just screens and screens of propaganda, not to mention all the other forms of brutality of the Soviet era. But I was told by essentially my boss at the time, you need to teach a survey of Soviet history. And whenever I have to teach a new area, the first thing I try to do is read memoirs by people who lived during that time and place and the most accessible memoirs at that time, this was in the early 2000s, were by Soviet dissidents. Uh, the reasons are not mysterious. Those memoirs were highly cultivated in the West during the era of the Cold War because they seemed to be voices from freedom fighters on the other side of the Iron Curtain, and they had no trouble uh, getting published either in the original Russian or in translation in the West. And the more I read around in these memoirs, the more I realized that this was an absolutely fascinating cohort of people, many of them highly educated, highly articulate, and uh, extraordinarily courageous in what they attempted to undertake in the 1960s and 70s and early 80s. The the sort of non-pragmatic reason was a kind of abiding curiosity on my part about what intellectuals do when they try to enter politics? How do people whose orientation uh, or character is very much geared to the life of the mind, how do they conduct themselves in the political arena, in in the rough and tough of politics? And I was particularly interested in that question in non-democratic settings. Uh, Not to state the obvious, but most of the world operates in non-democratic settings. Our own Uh, political situation in the United States uh, seems to be teetering a bit in that direction, but it's still fundamentally different from what it's like to be politically engaged in a country where there's no recognition of or admiration for political pluralism. So the, the spectacle of intellectuals in politics and particularly intellectuals in authoritarian political systems uh, was an abiding interest of mine. And I really couldn't think of a more, uh, compelling example than the dissident movement in the Soviet Union. That is an excellent answer. Um, yeah, many of these memoirs, I've read some of them myself, are absolutely compelling reading. Yes. So I would recommend them to people. So let's get right into the book. What led people to become dissidents in the Soviet Union? Who were they and how many were there? Yeah, well, let me start with the the last part. Um The number of dissidents was, if taken as a proportion of the total population or even of the total urban population or even the total population of intellectuals, people with a college degree or more, was extremely small. We're talking about a very, very small movement. We're not talking about, say, the civil rights movement in the United States, even though I think it's fair to describe the dissident movement, uh, the movement of so-called rights defenders, the Pravazeshitniki as not only a civil rights movement, but the first and most important civil rights movement in the second world, which is to say in the socialist world 
uh, during the Cold War. But the numbers were vanishingly small. I would say that if you if your criterion for who counts as a dissident is who ever signed even a single petition or open letter to Soviet authorities or to the United Nations or to what they used to call the global public, uh, it would be about a thousand. About a thousand people was the widest extent of letter signers. If though your uh, criterion is how many people read, copied, and distributed uncensored so-called samizdat or self-published texts, and here publication means somebody sat down at a typewriter with onion skin paper and carbon paper and made multiple copies of a novel, a tract, an essay, a screed, what have you. Then I think uh, we're talking about tens of thousands. And those tens of thousands, and we know this from the KGB investigation of some of the most important Samizdat publications, those tens of thousands were dispersed across the 11 time zones of the Soviet Union. Many of them, the lion's share, were in Moscow and Leningrad and Kiev, but we find dozens and dozens of cities where the KGB is tracking the dissemination, production, reproduction of Samizdat. If your criterion is who was exposed in any form to Samizdat texts, to the sort of the, the, the lifeblood of the, dissita- the, 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 the dis- dissident movement, then we have to include everybody who heard audio broadcasts of Samizdat texts made by the Western shortwave radio services, Voice of America, Radio Liberty, Deutsche Welle, BBC. Very hard to come up with concrete data, but I would estimate that that is millions possibly 10 million or more Soviet listeners at one time or another were tuning into those Western uh, radio stations. So, you know, the, in, in the way that we distinguish between active and passive citizens of any given society, we can distinguish between active and passive dissidents within the movement. But however you choose to define the circle of, of dissent, it's still a very, very small minority within the Soviet population. The first part of your question is who became a dissident and why? So I, along with many other scholars, have tried to come up with uh, categories that would sort of systemically explain what kind of people were prone to becoming dissidents. And we know, for example, that a very high proportion of the movement consisted of people with uh, people who came from what we would now call the STEM fields, scientists, computer scientists, mathematicians. There, you know, it's it's probably two thirds of the dissidents. Whether it's the thousand signers or the ten thousand distributors or the millions of listeners, very high proportion of natural scientists. But a very low proportion of the entire scientific community took part in the dissident movement. So you can't take, you know, the scientific worldview or the set of instincts of of organized skepticism that we used to describe scientific investigation as a causal agent because the the vast majority of people trained in the STEM fields in the Soviet Union did not become dissidents. Similarly, a very high proportion of the dissidents were Jews. Well over half, certainly of the most active dissidents. Yes, the people who who created the, the periodicals, who organized the demonstrations, who wrote the key texts, uh, it's definitely over 50%. And when I say Jews, I mean people born to what what the Soviet Union would have described as Jewish parents according to their nationality. But then again, you look at the Jewish population of the Soviet Union and you know probably fewer than 1% became dissidents. So if you want to say some you know ephemeral Jewish mindset or the 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 positionality of being Jewish in that kind of society led people to dissent, it it fails. It simply fails because it doesn't apply to the vast majority. So after trying, and I'm not the only one, to sort of come up with systemic <laughs> explanations of who became a dissident and why, I arrived at a different way of looking at the problem, which was if you look at the actual narratives that dissidents told about why they came to the movement, and there are over 150 book-length autobiographies by Soviet dissidents. Uh, that's a very high proportion. You know, if if you take the, the 
the inside concentric circle of a thousand people who signed, put their names on open letters, 150 of those thousand, that's 15%, wrote, wrote book length memoirs. That's an incredible fact. Anyway, the book length memoirs. It's also, it's also, it's also a great source. Oh, fantastic <laughs> source. I mean, it's, it's an historian's dream. Yeah. But it's also, it's also a very, uh, risky source because the, the risk is that you, you enter what my, what our mutual friend Peter Holquist once described to me as the echo chamber of dissident memoirs. They've all read each other's memoirs and it, it just becomes this very intramural kind of conversation. So for me, breaking out of that echo chamber and using archival documents, including KGB interrogation transcripts, was very important. But I digress. If you go back to what people said about their own trajectories, their own itineraries towards the movement, the really common denominator is that in one form or another, almost every dissident was put in a potentially morally compromising situation by the KGB. The, the most typical scenario was being pressured to become an informer on one's peers, friends, colleagues, relatives. That was the thing that put people before this agonizing f situation of an ethical, in some cases, existential dilemma. Do I betray my friends in order to protect myself? The people who became dissidents were the ones who stumbled over that, that stumbling block, as Andrei Sinyavsky, the writer, called it, and who decided that their ideals no longer matched the ideals of the country and of the Communist Party. So it's a very, it's a very individual story. And of course, many people were put in that ethical dilemma and did not become dissidents. But for characterological reasons or because of their very Soviet educations, their high-minded, idealistic educations, the dissidents were, repeat, were people who responded to that very widespread dilemma of being morally compromised by the KGB by breaking with it and, and either refusing to compromise or compromising and becoming informers and being so almost nauseous and sick at heart at what they had done that they retreat and take, choose a different path. Yeah. So in a weird sense, then the KGB helped produce the dissident movement. Absolutely. Not only helped to produce the dissident movement, but made global celebrities out of many people yeah, who, they did. Would, who would yeah. never, ever have become well done. Yeah. That's that's very interesting. I want to digress for a second about the KGB, about the transcripts, the interrogation transcripts. You, you got access to those. What What is the status of those today? I mean, I don't really, I haven't been in the game for a while, but uh, are, are those archives open? Yep. So here's the archival landscape today. And it's not that different from what it was before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The essentials haven't changed. And the essentials are this. The mother load, which is to say the KGB archive in Moscow, is virtually off limits. The only exceptions, and I did use this uh, before the war, I don't think it would work now, but the only exceptions are if uh, a dissident, a surviving dissident, or his or her descendants gives a researcher power of attorney. And in that case, you can get access to the KGB dossier of this or that dissident. Uh, an obscure law passed in the 1990s gave people the right to request access to their own KGB dossiers. But there are two back doors into this collection that proved much more significant for me. The first and most important is that all of the branch KGB archives in the non-Russian Soviet republics, so the former Lithuanian Republic of the USSR, the former Latvian and Estonian and Ukrainian and Georgian, all of the non-Russian branch operations of the KGB became independent agents with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And many of those archives are not only open for researchers, they love having researchers because they 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 want all of the KGB dirt to be brought to life to see how they got screwed by the Soviet Union. And in, for example, the Lithuanian KGB archive is the 30-volume um, research documentation for the trial of a very important 
dissident named Sergei Kovalyov, who was arrested and put on trial in Vilnius in 1975. Now, here's where the beauty of uh, the Russian and Soviet archival system really comes to the fore. As the country, so the archival system. Highly centralized country, highly centralized archival system. And this means that when Kovalyov's investigation was happening in Vilnius, the KGB officers there could request relevant documentation from the Moscow headquarters. And that means that in those 30 volumes of investigatory material, lots and lots of stuff from the mother load was copied. So there are unbelievable interrogation transcripts of many people not even directly connected with Kovalyov because, of course, the KGB was looking to implicate as many people as possible. So that was that was a gold mine. And I can tell you when I found that material, uh, and I, I don't want to say I discovered it because, you know, I was just a researcher working in an archive, that, that was one of the moments of euphoria working on this project because within half an hour of reading, I was like, oh my God, this is my dream. I have these four-hour, five-hour, eight-hour transcribed conversations between my protagonists and the representatives of the state. The other back door is that a number of dissidents uh, took advantage while things were really open, archivally speaking, in the 1990s to request their dossiers and to make complete photocopies of them. Andrei Sakharov's widow, Elena Bonner, did this with his archive. Uh, the, the writer, Andrei Sinyavsky, who I mentioned, did this. And then his widow sold that dossier to the Hoover Institution uh, in Stanford. So it's fragmented. It, you know, it's, it's nothing like what I'm sure the mother load looks like uh, in Moscow. The, the KGB archive in Moscow is an untapped uh, treasure. And I'm, I'm 90% certain that it includes not just interrogation transcripts of thousands of such sessions, but films of the demonstrations. We, we know that the KGB was filming day and night, including you using um, infrared photography for nighttime demonstrations. We probably would find audio recordings of thousands of bugged apartments. But I needed to get my book done, and I wasn't going to get access to that stuff anyway. But for the future, it's still there, and it's going to be a gold mine. Yeah, I wanted to digress a little bit further. Well, one comment, um, I knew some people who had grown up in East Germany, and the, the German authorities, after their Wiedervereinigung, after the reunification, um, they had a similar sort of law. You, you could go request your Stasi file. And I, I had a friend who requested her Stasi file, and she was very disappointed to find that it was extremely boring. <laughs> but you could do it. Can you still do that in Russia? Can you still go into the KGB and say, I'd like to see my file? I am not sure. I haven't had word that that law has been revoked. Um, But I, I myself, the last time I got power of attorney was... Uh, oh, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. So I don't really know for sure whether that law still applies. Yeah, yeah, I I, I, I see. Um, also, this business about copying things from other archives, I've seen this before yeah. as well. This is, yeah. this is pretty standard bureaucratic practice. Yes. Because you need uh, the background. And, and so here's the background. Yeah, and also, you know, governments uh, are complicated organisms and they have many, many different ministries. And so- I always tell my grad student, any document worth seeing is probably going to exist in multiple copies if it was yeah, that it significant. Is. Yeah. Multiple, probably numbered copies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Numbered yes. copies. Um, so uh, a, a follow-up question is, are there Russians working on this now? This is a bit of a digression too, but does anybody have access to the KGB files in Moscow? Are there any, is anybody Russians working on it? So there are Russians working on dissident <laughs> topics, but, and I'm in touch with some of them. And my impression is that they have no easier a time getting archival access than, than Westerners do. I mean, Westerners face the added risk of actually going to Russia, um, which as you know, is very problematic right now. But you know the the KGB is the seedbed of so much of the political elite 
in today's Russia that they they stand nothing to gain by right. by opening access to their own archive. Right, right. Okay, well, let's move on. The title of your book is To the Success of Our Hopeless Cause. What does that refer to? To the Success of Our Hopeless Cause, uh, or in Russian, Zauspiech Nashova Biesna Djorznova Djela, is probably the most famous dissident toast that would be made sitting <laughs> sitting around tables in Moscow and Leningrad and other cities across the Soviet Union. And for me, it brilliantly and succinctly captures the sort of the ethos, the emotional tonality of the movement, which was this ineffable Russian blend of boldness and despair. This sense of this is never going to work, but fuck it, we're going to do it anyway. Right. Right, right, right. Um, actually, I'm reminded of an anecdote that Ned Keenan told me, and he was talking to a, a, a dissident who had emigrated to the West, and he was involved, I don't know who it was, in one of these demonstrations, and he was called into a KGB office, and uh, the KGB officer sat him down, offered him a Marlboro cigarette, okay, and said, well, Yuri, or whatever his name was, what were you doing out there? And he said, I was protesting. And the KGB officer looks at him and says, I'm being serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. So then the subtitle of your book is The Many Lives of the Soviet Dissident Movement. Why many lives? That's a wordplay. The first meaning of many lives is uh, to call attention to the fact that the dissident movement experienced a number of near-death situations and reinvented itself and as I say in the book, reformatted itself in ways that I think were quite revealing, both of the inner dynamism within the movement, but also its response to the environment around it, including the strategies that the KGB used to try to crush it. So this was a movement that in a cat-like fashion uh, had multiple lives. Uh, at times it resembled a what we would call a social movement, um, a movement that brought together people who were not good friends of each other that, that used, as sociologists like to say, weak ties and not just strong ties to create organizational cohesion, but that at other times uh, shrank to really a friend of uh, a circle of friends, people with deep levels of intimacy and trust uh, going back years and years, uh, but who were much more elitist and exclusive. And it's still other times it modeled itself self-consciously on Western human rights NGOs, a kind of new post-World War II format for public movements. So that's the one meaning of the many lives. The, the, if, I the, just, if, I just, if I could just jump in right there before you go yeah. on. I, I lived in Ireland for a while, and I remember asking an Irish person, who is the most important person uh, in the kind of uh, the, the, the movement for United Ireland? And he said, Martin Luther King. <laughs> wow yeah because he would they were all inspired yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> there there's some of that in the case of the soviet union because as you can imagine the the american civil rights movement and generally the atrocious state of race relations was grist for the mill of soviet propaganda so readers of pravda and Izvestia were you know they had a version of that movement in, in that you remember well in all the times of angela davis and oh, yeah yeah stokely carmichael and yeah i remember this yeah 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 that was the, those were world so anyway, you've got to say the second meaning of many lives the second meaning of many lives is my attempt to uh push attention away from the people who became global celebrities, superstars, Nobel Prize winners, and who were cast as the engines and the leaders of the movement. Above all, the great Soviet writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1970, and the equally great uh, nuclear physicist and architect of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, um, Andrei Sakharov, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1975. It is no exaggeration to say that these people became household names all over the world. The problem is they were not leaders of the movement. In fact, Solzhenitsyn was a notorious non-team player. He was a solo operator. He did not want to get entangled in groups and movements and petitions. Uh, and Andrei Sakharov while much friendlier towards the movement, arrived relatively late in 1968 and 
was really not comfortable with the position of leader or spokesperson. And if you add to that the fact that the that the movement itself, the rank and file, a good number of them were hostile to the idea of any kind of hierarchy, leadership, formal division of labor, I wanted my book to call attention to the people who really made up uh, the the core of the movement, who created it, fashioned it, evolved with it. And that's the many lives, yeah, not the so famous ones. Yeah, you mentioned Solzhenitsyn. He was a rather prickly character. Uh, yes. Um, Although to be fair, very many dissidents uh, were, uh, if not prickly, difficult people. I mean, almost by definition, you have to be stiff-necked to, to do sure. what they did. But I was I was wondering, uh, to speak in uh, the language of sociology or even Russian history, were these dissident movements organized in... Russian word is Kruzhok, Kruzhki. Were there were there circles of people that were identified by the KGB? Like there's the oh here is the uh, you know the the Kruzhok in Saratov, and yeah. here is the Kruzhok in Kiev, and so on and so forth. How were they organized? They were very much organized in uh, the 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 cell. The sort of irreduc irreducible unit was was the the cell or the small group of intimate adult friends, men and women. They didn't call them Krushki, and I'm not sure why. They called them Kampanyi. Oh, um, really? That is interesting. Yes, that is yes. super interesting. And it was the bonds of friendship, above all, that were uh, the glue that held the movement together. And the KGB, even though I doubt it was reading uh, Mark Granovetter and other sociologists who pioneered network theory, the KGB was working with an implicit network theory about how the movement operated. And I actually found in the archives KGB diagrams of local dissident groups, which were literally circles, hubs, and spokes, and other circles, and who knew whom, and who was giving samistat to whom. So they very much operated on the assumption that this was a leadership-based movement with little leaders, bigger leaders, and then union-wide leaders, which is not really accurate, but it does tell us a lot about the way the KGB approached the problem. That is very interesting that they didn't call them Krushki, I because that has a certain resonance for people that know yes. Russian history. I mean, everybody yes. knows about these things. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's very. That's I, I suspect that the write an article about that. <laughs> maybe you should. I, I, I suspect that the the allergy towards the word kruzhok, uh, the the singular for for kruzhki, a circle. Circle. It means circle. Is, yeah. Yeah. Is that it was it was tainted by association with the underground revolutionary movements of the nineteenth century, and the dissidents did not want that pedigree. They did not want to make another revolution. They did not want revolutionary upheaval in the Soviet Union. They had lived through the consequences of revolutionary violence. And so they shunned that language. They shunned the language of, of conspiracy, of, of political violence uh, in favor of, as one of them called it, a meta revolution, a revolution in the way revolutions are accomplished. Yeah. So let's get to the kind of nuts and bolts of the movement itself. How did they voice criticism? How were they able to do this? I mean, obviously, we live in, you know, it's a totalitarian society. Everybody's watching everybody. The KGB is a strong force. Uh, how are they able, actually, to get the word out about what they were doing, at least to the people that they wanted to get the word to? Sure. Let me start with um, the context, which you yourself invoke. So what, what environmental factors made this kind of behavior possible? And then we can try to figure out what actually motivated it. So there's a debate worth having about whether the Soviet Union after 1956, after Khrushchev's secret speech uh, denouncing some, by no means all, but some of what Stalin had done, about whether the post-1956 uh, Soviet Union really fits the description of totalitarian. It's a debate that was happening in real time among Western observers, including the person who did more than anybody else to put the concept of totalitarianism on the global map, and that is the political philosopher Hannah Arendt. If you look at the third edition of her amazing monumental study on totalitarianism, the origins of totalitarianism, in the preface, she herself raises the question of whether Khrushchev's Soviet Union still qualifies as a totalitarian country. And I myself think that the break with totalitarianism begins not in 
1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, not even in 1987 with the beginnings of Gorbachev's Perestroika. It really begins in the late 1950s. And the reason why I say that is that it's it's in the aftermath of Stalin's dictatorship that the Soviet leadership is determined to remove political terror, the mass application of terror by the state, remove that from the repertoire of governing practices. Uh, on the most cynical level, they wanted to do that because political terror was lethal for the Communist Party. The most, the most dangerous thing to be in the 1930s at the height of the purges and the executions was a member of the party. Yeah, it, I don't think many people realize this, actually, that, that you really were in trouble if you were a member of the party. It had any history at all. Yes. And if you were a member of the security services, the predecessors to the KGB, that was even more dangerous. It's, it's, it's paradoxical, but to be at the epicenter of the purge mechanism was actually the most dangerous place in the Soviet Union. So if only for sheer uh, survival, the leadership wanted to put an end to the use of political terror. And remember, terrorism as a term, if used responsibly, means not violence, not killing, but the random application of violence and killing. The, the thing that scares people is when there's no logic to who is targeted. That produces the largest number of potential targets and therefore the greatest degree of fear. And what they were what they were determined to do after 1956 was to no longer randomly apply political violence. People who got arrested after 1956, with some but few exceptions, were arrested for actually doing the things they did. That's a huge difference from the 1930s. Yeah, yeah no, that's exactly right. Once you subtract political terror from the repertoire of governing practices, and you leave the other major pillars of the system in place, namely command economy, one-party system. But when you remove mass terror sponsored by the state, that creates a whole new landscape. And that is the enabling factor that makes something like the dissident movement possible. And you put it beautifully in your in, at the beginning of your question, what caused these people to give voice to their dissatisfaction? And voice is the key word. Because during the Stalin era, the most common form of dissent was silence. Now, that may sound wimpy to you. That may sound like no, no real, genuine version of dissent. But remember, we're talking about not just a dictatorship, but a participatory dictatorship, which demands not just the passive consent of the governed, but the active participation of the governed in the rituals and the language of the Soviet project. And so being silent was actually a big thing to do. It meant you didn't speak up at the political meetings. You didn't attend the rallies. You didn't march. And that could get you in trouble. But it, under the new dispensation after Stalin, being silent was seen as no longer adequate. And that's what caused people to actually voice their ideas a very small number, of course, uh, as we were talking about earlier, but that's what made giving voice to ideas possible. And it was never really crystal clear where the borders were between the permissible and the impermissible. Everybody knew that there was active censorship, pervasive censorship in the Soviet Union of print media, of radio, of television, of you know school curricula, everything. But unlike say, the Catholic Church, the Soviet government never published a list of banned books. So it was hard to know, like, is, you know, is this in, is this out, is this legal, is this illegal? There was this huge gray area, uh, nor was it clear, you know, who you were allowed to mention in print at any given time. People went in and out of favor. And because the system never publicly acknowledged its own censorship, there was an enormous space for testing the waters. And that's what the dissidents did. Mm -hmm. So uh, this may sound like a silly question, but if you're correct, and I'm sure you are, that after 56 or sometime approaching 1960, political terror is over and things are safer, what are the dissidents on about? What, what, what do they want to happen? 
what what are they protesting? What issues do they have? If, if they're not terribly worried, or maybe they are terribly worried about a return to Stalinism, what are they complaining about? Initially, the overriding concern of the movement is precisely a return to Stalinism. And that return, I'm uh, sorry, that fear is heightened by Khrushchev's removal from power and the uncertainty about what's going to follow. So that's in October 1964. Uh, so it's a fear of return to Stalinism and a return to terror, which you know decimated the intelligentsia, among many other groups. There had always been many, many sources of discontent in the Soviet Union, as in any society. There is never a shortage of things to grumble about. But the the grand strategy of the dissident movement was first articulated by uh, a, a man named Alexander Voipin. Uh, and I spend the first chapter of the book talking about his biography. He's an absolutely fascinating person, no longer alive, but I did get to meet him several times and spent many hours talking with him um, at his apartment outside Boston. He was the uh, extramarital son of one of the most famous Russian poets of the 20th century, uh, not famous in the West, but hugely famous in Russia, Sergei Yusinin. Yusinin, yeah. Yeah. So the, the son's full name was Alexander Sergeyevich Yusinin Volpin. And Volpin was a mathematician. But more than that, he was a mathematical logician, which is to say he was interested in questions like what makes it possible for mathematical statements to be true? What is, the, what is the nature of proof? So he was interested in a lot of meta issues, the nature of mathematical claims. And like many intellectuals, I won't go into the details, but like many intellectuals, uh, Volpin fell into the trap of the KGB and was arrested in the 1940s and exiled to uh, Karaganda, to what is now Kazakhstan. He also spent time in psychiatric hospitals uh, because the KGB didn't want to put the son of one of the most famous Russian poets on trial. And Volpin, as a mathematician, as someone interested in uh, creating a mathematically rigorous, pure, precise, scientifically perfect language, eventually came up with the idea that if you could just make the Soviet government observe its own laws including laws laws about civil liberties, things would be a lot better. And so the grand strategy of the Soviet, uh, Soviet dissident movement was to make the Soviet government live up to its own legal system. And that is the message that they broadcast over and over and over again. The first occasion when Volpin and others went public with this message was when two writers, Andrei Sinavsky and Yuli Daniel, were arrested in September of 1965 and a very famous incident. And remember, this is less than a year after Khrushchev's fall from power. And there was a panic about, are we about to return to the Stalin era show trial system uh, and a massive crackdown, including on innocent people? And Volpin organized a demonstration, the so-called transparency demonstration, meeting Glasnisty in December of 1965, in which the demand was and this is literally what was written on the the banner that he held up. I, I there's a photograph of it in my book. Observe uh, the Constitution of the USSR. The the demonstration was held on Constitution Day, December fifth. That's the day that the the 1936 Soviet Constitution was ratified. And if you bother to look at that Constitution, it contains wonderful guarantees of civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. It's true they all have to conform with the interests of the working class, but since those interests are not spelled out, it looks like a, a robust protection of civil liberties. And the dissident movement, above all, was about making those constitutional protections real. <laughs> I have to ask this question. Do, did, did anyone in the... I, I'm kind of tongue-tied here. Did anyone in the government, did anyone powerful take them seriously? Did they think, hmm, maybe they're on to something here? Uh, <laughs> they were they were only taken seriously in the th in the sense of being taken as a threat. Threat. And yeah, the right, yeah. the reflexive response, and we know this from the internal government memoranda 
that responded to the petitions and the demonstrations and the open letters, the reflective response was, these people are agents of Western intelligence services who are trying to stir up trouble in the Soviet Union. There was there was never a substantive engagement with the actual demands. It's, it's astonishing. And what's even more astonishing, and this is one of the things that it was really revelatory to me when I was going through all those KGB interrogation transcripts, is that unlike their predecessors in the 1930s, the people who worked for uh, what was called the NKVD, the, K- the KGB's predecessor, the interrogators really could not have cared less about the beliefs of the dissidents. They were not there to unmask them and to expose their class background and their warped worldviews. They didn't care about the dissidents' ideas. They just wanted to finger them and to learn who their associates were so that they could arrest more people. It was a a profound ideological apathy on the card of the KGB by the 1960s. Yeah, these people were sort of ticket punchers, as my father would have said. And and Mm -hmm. they, uh, yeah, it is a very interesting comparison, though, because you're right. In the late 20s and 30s, they were all about ideology. They were all about arguing at each other. They were really making, I don't know if they were substantive arguments, but they were very interested in ideas. Yes. And, and you know, I'm not going to say that the intellectual level was super high, but they definitely got into the weeds with the people they were interrogating about what they believed. Yes. They wanted people to bear their souls to the KGB. Yeah. yeah but not, not, not in the period you're talking about. That is, that is very interesting. So let's, let's switch gears just a little bit. Um, you've already said that a very, there's a very small group of people um, what was the attitude of the Soviet people toward this and movement? I guess there's a this that uh, sort of implies that the Soviet people knew about it. Did they know about it? Anybody who listened to the shortwave radio broadcasts knew a lot about it. Um, entire Samizdat novels were broadcast over the shortwave radio services, the BBC, the Voice of America, Radio Liberty. You know, we today we're accustomed to audio books. And all kinds of audio media, including the ones that the one that you and I are engaged like in right podcast. now. Yes, yeah. um, but this this was a already a very significant factor in the 1960s and 70s for millions and millions of Soviet listeners. You know, I should add just by way of footnote that um, because of its excellent education system, the Soviet Union produced a highly technically literate population, and there were lots and lots of people with training as engineers. And those people could easily purchase an FM radio transistor and convert it into a shortwave transistor radio. So uh, it, it was not really very difficult to, to receive shortwave radio broadcasts in the Soviet Union. So I think knowledge of the existence of the movement was quite extensive. Of course, it's always difficult to say what did the population think because you know, if if your year is 1965 or 1975, we're talking about 200, 250, 290 million people. So it's very difficult to generalize. I think that uh, at least initially, there was a considerable degree of sympathy and what we would now call allyship with the dissidents, especially among the educated uh, urban elites. And we know this because People provided material assistance to the families of dissidents who'd been arrested and been sent off to the camps. You know, people left behind, typically wives and children, uh, they had lost a major source of income and they were uh, they, they faced the risk of really sinking into poverty, not, not to mention the social ostracization. Here again, another contrast with the 30s. When someone is arrested in the 30s, the the the, the fear that permeated that society led them to be completely cut off, often by their own relatives. Yeah, you don't know brothers. them anymore. Yeah, you never yeah. knew them. Yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was a form of what I would call social death in the 30s. In the 60s and 70s, dissidents who were arrested, in many cases, acquired new friends and support out of sympathy with what had happened with them. And because the consequences of expressing your uh, your solidarity with such people were much uh, less severe than they had been in the 30s. Um, but, you know, most people, I think, in the Soviet Union, and I, and I say I think because it's very hard to generalize, not even the Soviet government really knew what its population was thinking at any given time. 
I think a large number of people in the Soviet Union were very suspicious of the dissidents. Um, why were their connections with the West so good? Why? Yeah, I, was, I, I wanted to drill down on that question in particular, because once they became famous in the West, this became kind of a propaganda tool for the Soviet state itself. Absolutely. And it was prime, according to them, it was prima facie evidence that these people were in cahoots yes. with Western powers. Yes. So it, it exactly reversed cause and effect, right? The West didn't recruit these people. The West didn't uh, didn't infect them with Western liberal ideas. They came to those ideas in a very Soviet manner, I would say. The dissident movement was populated by people who were Soviet people, born and bred and trained and educated by the Soviet Union. And they used Soviet ingredients, above all Soviet law, to formulate their grand strategy. But the West, of course, given the Cold War context, was extremely receptive to what looked like freedom fighters on the other side of the Iron Curtain. You know, it, it's as if these little liberals uh, had just been born on the wrong side of that uh, East-West divide, but they seemed, they were talking the language of rights and the rule of law. So uh, the, the Western media had a field day with the dissidents and elevated some of them, you know, Sakharov, Solzhenitsyn and others, to uh, truly global celebrity status. And so that was used retroactively or retrospectively to cast the dissidents as nothing other than agents of Western propaganda. And I think a lot of Soviet Union, uh, Soviet citizens shared that suspicion. And then, you know, it, it, it didn't help that the, the KGB planted all kinds of rumors about dissidents receiving payments, monetary compensation, uh, other forms of material assistance from abroad. And before long, they were being cast as Judases. Yeah. You know, yeah, who, who yeah. betrayed I, I, the I, Jesus. I, I was really interested in your point about the Western view of these people. I'm reminded of this. Um, there's a scene in, I think it's Full Metal Jacket, where a, an American army colonel is talking about the Vietnamese. And he says, inside every Vietnamese, there's an American trying to get out. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if you look at some of these people, Solzhenitsyn is the great example. When they get to the West, they're completely baffled by it, utterly baffled. They do not understand it at all. And I mean, I have personal experience with this, having helped some Russians come to, or Soviet people come to, they are generally baffled by it um, and, and not particularly pleased either with what they find. Yes. I would say the the reverse is true too. A lot of people were baffled that Solzhenitsyn emerged as a Russian nationalist who was opposed to modern yeah. industrial society. <laughs> yeah, the, the level of mutual incomprehension was very high. But the, the, the vignette from Full Metal Jacket is brilliant because it sort of, it takes sol solipsism to a whole new level. You know, that inside, <laughs> inside everybody is a, is a little American just begging to little get American out. American trying to get out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. As, as one dissident who I met uh, put it memorably, at some point, uh, you realize there's a big difference between a Westerner and a Westernizer. So even <laughs> even even a Soviet citizen who thought that they yeah. they loved Western society yeah. and Western ideals, it, it it's yeah, it, it no. was a very selective uh, appropriation yeah. of those yeah. ideas. No, it's it's this 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 whole topic is so full of ironies. I don't know what to say. It's very rich. So um, we've taken up a lot of your time. I I want to ask about the dissident movement and the collapse of the USSR. Yep. Did it contribute to the collapse of the USSR? It did, but we need to be careful about uh, what we conclude in terms of how and why and to what extent. There That's was, why we have you. Yes. <laughs> happy to serve. Um, there, there was a time of the euphoria of the Gorbachev years, and um, I'd say they lasted about three or four in total, when a reasonable observer, and there were many, would have concluded that Gorbachev had essentially appropriated the slogans and the ideals of the dissident movement. And when I say slogans, I mean literally the slogan of Glasnost that you may remember from that period. That was that was central to uh, dissident discourse. They used that term over and over again in the sense of judicial transparency, of making trials open to the public and making the Soviet Union observe its own laws. Another of Gorbachev's slogans was democratization or democratization. The dissident movement was often called the democratic movement. It, it had multiple names. Um, and so much of what was coming out of Gorbachev's mouth appeared to be 
taken from the dissident lexicon and the dissident playbook. And so people, especially in the West and, and several dissidents themselves succumbed to this, said, we did it. We, we essentially, <laughs> we, we used the Kremlin as our Trojan horse. We finally got a guy in there who, who talked our talk and we brought down communism and we brought down the Soviet empire. That's okay. funny, just to digress for a second um, before you go on. I remember, I, I can't recall it, when this conversation occurred, I said, what, what did you do as a uh, Russian historian, Marshall? He said, well, you know, I was trained on government grants, so I'm going to put, I won the Cold War on my TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, as they say, victory has a thousand fathers. Y yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and defeat yeah. is an orphan. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So, so go ahead. Let's, so let's, let's take a deep breath and stand back and scrutinize those claims. The first thing to note is Gorbachev never intended to destroy the Soviet Union. That was never his intention. He wanted to perfect the Soviet system. The second observation, after taking another deep breath, the dissidents had no intention, didn't even dream that the Soviet Union would fall apart. So right away, we need to deal with a situation of unintended consequences rather than telling a feel-good Hollywood story of a band of intrepid dissidents who brought down this behemoth called the USSR. Right. So, I mean, you make an important distinction here. It, it did not ever occur to them that this would happen. It wasn't as if they considered it and then discarded it. Yes. It did not appear in their minds. Yes. That's a big difference. <laughs> with, with one very notable exception... Uh, my favorite dissident in many ways, a man named Andre Amalric, who wrote a Samizdat book in 1969 called Will the, Un Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? He chose 1984 because it was an Orwellian year and because it was just far enough off, you know, 1969 plus 15 years gets you to 1984, um, to be kind of beyond the horizon of, of expectations. And he put it out there as a kind of polemical uh, question. But nobody expected the Soviet Union to collapse 15 years later. It, the Soviet Union was forever. It, 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 after the mass oh, violence- I remember this well, Ben. I mean, and when it happened, I, I mean, people were all saying, you know, well, why didn't you guys predict this? I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. What are you he, kidding? He didn't predict it because it was unpredictable. I mean, it's, you, you can, you can in, in hindsight, of course, everybody can be a genius and, and pretend they saw it coming, but very, very few people had any inkling that, that this was going to happen. So how did the Soviet dissidents contribute to this? Um, the Soviet Union fell apart overwhelmingly for economic, geopolitical, and uh, nationalist reasons. But what the dissidents did by demanding over and over again that the Soviet Union obey its own laws and by essentially demonstrating that the system was incapable of honoring its own legal system, they helped delegitimize it. They helped sap it of moral credibility. And that meant that it was much more fragile, much more brittle than it might have been if it could have made a, a convincing case that it honored its own legal system. And this brings me to something that I think is important from an historical point of view. And then I think, uh, well, I'll be interested to hear your, your thoughts about it. The Soviet Union collapsed like a house of cards. What was shocking was not just that a system fell apart, or not just that a superpower, one of the two superpowers fell apart, but that it fell apart in peacetime without a war that stressed it to its foundations, and it fell apart extremely quickly, breathtakingly quickly. Now, to me, that is part of a pattern in Russian history. The imperial government also fell apart very quickly and with remarkably little resistance. Now, it's true there was a, there was a, a world war going on that did emphatically stress that system beyond its capacities. But what's remarkable about the collapse of the Tsarist empire is how little resistance there was. It was only almost a full year after the collapse of the Romanov dynasty that a civil war broke out and forces of military resistance 
to the breakup of the empire finally got their act together and attacked the Bolsheviks. And if you go back even further to the abolition of serfdom, serfdom was the bedrock of the Russian social system. And yet, when it was abolished by uh, a decree from the Tsar himself in 1861, there was almost no resistance by the ruling classes. So this is a deep and enigmatic pattern in Russian history. It's again, it's not that it's not that systems breaking down uh, is is unusual. It's it's this impression that you get, and as you said, starting as early as the 17th century and on to the late 20th, the impression that the system is somehow already hollowed out. And therefore, when it does break down, it happens really fast and with astonishingly little resistance by people whose, whose interests you would think were deeply embedded in the old regime. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with all of that. I was very pleased when the Soviet Union fell apart relatively peacefully. It could have been otherwise. Yes. And in a catastrophic way. But yeah, it wasn't. So, and that, you know, is a pretty it, incredible thing. It wasn't, but it may be that the violence we're seeing now is the violence that we expected to happen much sooner after right. the collapse. It's delayed. Yeah, it's absolutely delayed. Okay, let me ask uh, another question. Why, why the history of the Soviet dissident movement now? Why now? Why is this interesting now? To me, because uh, we are living in the authoritarian moment in much of the world. And the the interests that I mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, namely, what kind of political options are open for people in authoritarian systems? What is their thought process when they try to invoke rights, invoke the rule of law in systems that pay lip service to those qualities, but abuse them constantly with respect to real or perceived political opponents? Those questions, I think, are very much alive in today's world. But more generally, if you think about the title of the book taken from that dissident toast to the success of our hopeless cause, uh, no matter where you stand on the political spectrum in the United States today, whether you're on the right and you see creeping liberalism, um, um, the kind of decay of the traditional family, uh, your sense is that history is on the side of the progressives. If you're a progressive and on the left half of the political spectrum, spectrum, you have this despairing sense that the United States is in the process of letting go of its democratic institutions and that we ourselves are slipping into a kind of authoritarianism that we thought was impossible here. Whatever your particular flavor of hopelessness, I would argue, I would argue that if you stand back and look and absorb the story of the Soviet dissident movement, you will realize that these were people who were operating in a system that was a hundred times more hopeless than the one that we inhabit today. And in that sense, I think their story can be uh, a source of, if not hope, at least a new way of looking at possible avenues of escape from what is increasingly feeling like a hopeless situation. And even if you're not particularly politically engaged and you don't share the despair of the left or the right and you just think that things like environmental degradation, global warming, or the growth of inequality both within countries and between countries seem like inexorable forces and we just don't have the will or the mechanisms to counter them. Again, I would say take a look at the story of Soviet dissidents and you'll find people who are up against a much higher and more formidable and dangerous set of challenges than we are. And I think you'll find their story inspiring. Well, they're brave people. They were no very doubt. brave people. Yeah. Um, I uh, had the occasion to read a biography of, wow, I can't believe I'm, uh, Vasily Grossman, who has become my hero. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Vasily Gross, uh, uh, absolutely incredible guy. Um, amazing, not only great literary talent, but just an amazing person. Very brave, also very skillful. Um, it, he's just somebody who I've I read the biography and it was wow, no, it's just an amazing person. And I'm sure that you, your book is full of such amazing people who can do those it kinds is. of things. It is, yeah, 
so in a sense, me, the, the movement self-selected for well, remarkable right. people. Th that's exactly right. And in a kind of strangely random way, you don't know if you have it in you until, until you, you know, do, until you do. And then, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, people often wonder, well, what I do that, what I do that. I, I don't know. I've never been put in a situation like that. And God forbid I ever would be. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what I would do. Um, so yeah, but full of, full of very brave people. That that's certainly the case. Um, before we close, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, an organization you've been involved with for a long time, and that's Memorial. Um, can you talk a little bit about Memorial, what it is, and uh, what it's doing today? Sure. Yeah. First of all, there's a great uh, history of Memorial by uh, my colleague Kathleen Smith um, that I highly recommend. It tells the story of how it was created by. Uh, mostly by Soviet dissidents and what its ambitions were. So um, Memorial, and I, I feel weird talking about it in the past tense, so I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but Memorial was uh, fashioned in the final years of the Gorbachev era. Um, its sort of presiding spirit was Andrei Sakharov, at least until he died in, in December of 1989. And it was set up with a dual mission, one mission was to reclaim the memory and make public the memory of the many, many victims of Stalinism, of the terror, the political terror, the deportations, the camps, the executions of the 1930s and 1940s. In this sense, it was a an organization whose mission was educational, to educate the Russian population about their own history, and particularly the history that had been silenced and suppressed by the Soviet state. The other mission, and they saw the two as inextricably tied to each other, was to be a human rights advocacy NGO and to support human rights in today's Russia. And the reason why they saw those two agendas as inextricably connected was that they believed that enlightening the Russian population about the extraordinary uh, violations of basic human rights in the 1930s was an important way of ensuring that such violations would never happen again. Memorial uh, did many things. It assisted human rights movements <clears throat> in uh, many issues, women's rights, the rights of national minorities, uh, the rights of ordinary Russians to due process and other legal protections. It also amassed <clears throat> an extremely rich archive of its own. And this was something relatively new and unusual in Russian history, which is an archive uh, owned and organized and cataloged by an entity other than the state. It was a non-state archive, and that's extremely important. You don't, you never want states to monopolize the documentary uh, foundation of a historical knowledge. So uh, Memorial amassed an archive of the dissident movement which was obviously very near and dear to its heart, but also an archive of um, people who were enslaved by the Nazis during the Second World War and deported to Germany and forced to work. All kinds of marginalized populations in Soviet history were the object of its interests. And it became a truly public organization in the sense of hosting conferences and talks and film screenings and, and everything that sort of is the bedrock of public discourse and of civil society. It was one of the most important civil society organizations in Russia. Sadly, uh, it had a very um, adversarial relationship with the Russian state. And I, I do not hesitate to, play, to place the blame for that adversarial relationship uh, on one side and one side alone. And that was the Russian state. Um, the Putin government became less and less comfortable with independent sources of authority. This seems to be an abiding problem in Russian political culture. That is, states that simply cannot coexist with truly independent sources of opinion and authority. The friction started long before the, the present conflict in Ukraine. In a sense, the, the first major turning point was the passing of an now infamous law in 2012 about foreign agents like many public uh, and civil society organizations in Russia, Memorial received part, not all, but part of its funding from Western foundations, the Soros Foundation, the Ford Foundation, um, the National Endowment for Democracy. And this, the Russian government under Putin used foreign funding as the 
wedge by which to first stigmatize and then systematically dismantle and finally liquidate Memorial and many other NGOs. And without going into all the details, uh, the denouement occurred in the weeks and months leading up to the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022. This was a premeditated, systematic campaign to decapitate all forms of what I'm sure were, were anticipated sources of resistance to the war and protest against the war. It was all done methodically in advance of the invasion. And so by the time the invasion did occur, Memorial had essentially been destroyed as an NGO. Even after receiving or sharing the Nobel Peace Prize, Memorial was simply powerless. And what is so troubling to me, in part because it echoes to what happened to the dissidents in the 1970s, was the lack of public protest over the dismantling of the of the Memorial Society and also of uh, the Moscow Helsinki Group, the Andrei Sakharov Center. There were protests, but they were tiny and they really made no difference at all. And this, this is one of the sort of crippling weaknesses. Uh, it was the crippling weakness of the dissident movement, but also of these NGOs, Memorial and others, is that they, they never sank deep roots into the Russian population. Mm-hmm. Where is Memorial now? What is its status? What happened to its archives? Uh, various members of Memorial have been arrested, above all, uh, Alyeg Arlov. Um, there was a famous internet meme of him sitting at his trial in a Moscow courtroom, uh, demonstratively reading the book, the novel by Franz Kafka called The Trial. The Trial. Yeah. 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 Um, this seems to be an, an emerging sort of iconography among uh, protesters in Russia is to have yourself photographed in court reading a book and the book signals what's on your mind. So Arlov had Kafka and uh, Vladimir Karamurza was reading uh, Solzhenitsyn's memoirs, The Oak and the Calf, at his trial. So some have been arrested, others have fled the country, and still others have gone quiet. The archive has not yet been destroyed. It is being digitized, um, which is an a, a, just an enormous undertaking, as you can imagine. You know, this is a major, major non-state archive. I wish the digitization had happened earlier, you know, before the crisis hit, but they are doing what they can to preserve what they have. And what they preserve, what they have is truly part of Russia's patrimony, a critical part of Russia's patrimony. And I yeah. hope I hope it is preserved for future generations. I hope so too. I, I really do. Is it possible for... Uh, it, for people to donate money or give money to Memorial outside of Russia? Is it, do they have any presence anywhere? I don't know, in Frankfurt or wherever they might be? It is. Yes, there are Friends of Memorial organizations across Western Europe and the United States, and they are indeed fundraising to support. Yeah, well, look that and, up. And people. maintain. Yes. Yeah, look that up. Yeah, because it's obviously a, an important. An important thing. Well, Ben, I we again we've taken up a lot of your time. I'm really sorry about that. Marshall, <laughs> it was a sorry pleasure. It, it, it was, was a pleasure as always. Yeah, let me tell everybody that we were talking to Ben Nathans about his book To the Success of Our Hopeless Cause, The Many Lives of the Soviet Dissident Movement. It's out from Prince of University Press in August. Thanks everybody for listening. Bye, Ben. Bye, Marshall. Thanks again.